What factors motivate companies to choose one inventory method over another? What factors have caused the increased popularity of LIFO? Choosing among alternative accounting methods is a complex issue. Often, such choices are not made in isolation, but in a way that the combination of inventory cost flow assumption, the depreciation method, pension assumption, and other choices meet a particular objective. Also, many believe managers sometimes make these choices to maximize their own personal benefits rather than those of the company or its external constituents. But regardless of the motive, the impact on reported numbers is an important consideration in each choice of method. If a company wanted to choose a method that most closely approximates specific identification, then the actual physical flow of inventory in and out of the company would motivate the choice of method. For example, companies often attempt to sell the oldest goods in inventory first for some of their products. This certainly is the case with perishable goods like grocery items. The FIFO method best mirrors the physical flow in these situations. The average cost method might be used for liquids such as chemicals where items sold are taken from a mixture of inventory acquired at different times and different places, different prices. There are a few inventories that actually flow in a LIFO manner. It's important to understand that there is no requirement that companies choose an inventory method that approximates actual physical flow, and few companies make the choice on this basis. In fact, the effect of inventory method on income and income taxes is the primary motivation that influences the method of choice. If the unit cost of inventory changes during a period, the inventory method chosen can have a significant effect on the amount of income reported on the company of the company to external parties and also on the amount of income taxes paid to the IRS, <coughs> along with state and local taxing authorities. Over the entire life of the company, cost of goods sold for all years will equal actual costs of items sold regardless of the inventory method. However, different inventory methods can produce significantly different results in each particular year. When prices rise and inventory quantities are not decreasing, LIFO produce, produces a higher cost of goods sold and therefore a lower net income than the other methods. The company's income tax returns will report a lower taxable income using LIFO and lower taxes will be paid currently. There are not reduced, these taxes aren't reduced permanently, but they're only deferred. The reduced amount will be paid to the taxing authorities when either the unit cost of inventory or the quantity of inventory subsequently declines. We know from our discussion of the time value of money, it's advantageous to save a dollar today, even if it must be paid back in the future. In the past, high inflation, which is increasing prices, motivated many companies to switch to LIFO in order to gain this tax benefit. A corporation's taxable income comprises revenues, expenses, including cost of goods sold, gains and losses, measured according to the regulations of the appropriate taxing authority. Income before tax is reported in the income statement does not always equal taxable income. In some cases, differences are caused by the use of different measurement methods. However, IRS regulations, which determine federal taxable income, require if a company uses LIFO to measure taxable income, the company also must use LIFO for external financial reporting. This is known as the LIFO conformatory rule with, with respect to inventory methods. Because of the LIFO conformatory rule, to obtain the tax advantage of using LIFO in periods of rising prices, Lower net income is reported to shareholders, creditors, and other external parties. The income tax motivation for using LIFO may be offset by a desire to report higher net income. Reported net income could have an effect on the corporation's share price, on bonuses paid to management, or on debt agreements with lenders. So research has indicated that the managers of companies with bonus plans tied to income measures are more likely to choose accounting methods that maximize their bonuses, which are those that increase net income. The LIFO conformatory rule 
permits LIFO users to report non-LIFO inventory valuations in a disclosure note, but not on the face of the income statement. So which of these is not a factor that motivates companies to choose one method over another? A, how closely reported costs reflect the actual physical flow of inventory. B, the timing of reported income and income tax expense. C, how well costs are matched with associated revenues. Or D, to make it easier for managers to maximize their own personal benefits rather than those of the company or its external ex constituents. Although many believe managers sometimes make choices to maximize their own personal benefits rather than those of the company or its external constituents, it's not one of the reasons companies choose to use one method over another. Many companies are using LIFO for external reporting and income tax purposes, but maintain their internal records using FIFO or average cost. Generally, the conversion to LIFO from the internal records occurs at the end of the reporting period without actually entering the adjustment into the company's records. Some companies enter the conversion adjustment, the difference between the internal method and LIFO, directly into the records as a contra account to revenue. This contra account is called the LIFO reserve or the LIFO allowance. There are a variety of reasons, including the high record keeping costs for LIFO, the contractual agreements such as bonus or profit sharing plans that calculate net income with a method other than LIFO, and using FIFO or average cost information for pricing decisions. The entry to increase the LIFO reserve also involves an increase to cost of goods sold. The debit to cost of goods sold increases total expenses and therefore lowers reported profitability. If the difference between inventory valued internally using FIFO and inventory valued using LIFO has decreased over the year, the LIFO reserve would need to be decreased with a debit. The corresponding credit would be to cost of goods sold. In this situation, when cost of goods sold is decreased, profits will increase. The situation demonstrates that even though reported inventory is lower under LIFO than FIFO, LIFO profits might be larger than FIFO profits when the LIFO reserve decreases during the year. Under the LIFO, inventory is reported in the 2015 balance sheet at a lower amount, which indicates the need for a LIFO reserve of $4,000. $645. The LIFO reserve at the beginning of 2015 was already $4,636, so its balance needs to be increased by only $9,000. The increase is recorded with a credit to the LIFO reserve. At the same time, we increase or we debit the cost of goods sold, thereby reducing the reported profit. Proponents of LIFO argue that it results in a better match of revenues and expenses. Sales reflect the most recent selling prices and cost of goods sold include the costs of the most recent purchases. For the same reason though, inventory costs in the balance sheet with LIFO generally are out of date because they reflect old purchase transactions. It's not uncommon for a company's LIFO inventory balance to be based on units cost actually incurred several years earlier. This distortion sometimes carries over to the income statement as well. When inventory quantities decline during a period, then these out-of-date inventory costs are liquidated and cost of goods sold will partially match non-current costs with current selling prices. If costs have been increasing, LIFO liquidations produce higher net income than would have resulted if the liquidated inventory were included in cost of goods sold at current rates. The paper profits or the losses caused by including out of date, low cost, and cost of goods sold is referred to as the effect on income of liquidations of LIFO inventory. 
So included in cost of goods sold are 5,000 units from beginning inventory that have now been liquidated. If the company had purchased at least 35,000 units, no liquidation would have occurred. Then cost of goods sold would have been 875,000, which would be the 35,000 units at 25 bucks per unit instead of 850,000. The difference between these two cost of goods sold figures is 25,000, which is the 875 minus the 850. This is the before tax income effect of the LIFO liquidation. We also can determine the $25,000 before tax LIFO liquidation profit by multiplying the 5,000 units liquidated by the difference between the $25 current cost per unit and the $20 acquisition cost per unit we included in cost of goods sold. Assuming a 40% income tax rate, the net effect of the liquidation is to increase net income by 15,000, which is the 25,000 times the 1 minus 40%. The lower the cost of the units liquidated, the more severe the effect on income. So here we have another concept question for you. Doyle Corporation adopted the LIFO inventory method in 2018, its first year. Doyle disclosed that if FIFO had been used, inventory at the end of 2018 would have been 36 million higher than the inventory determined using the LIFO method. Assuming Doyle's income tax rate is 40%, A, its reported cost of goods sold for 2018 would have been 21.6 million higher if it had used FIFO rather than LIFO for its financial statements. B, its reported net income for 2018 would have been 21.6 million higher if it had used FIFO rather than LIFO for its financial statements. Its reported net income for 2018 would have been 36 million higher if it had used FIFO rather than LIFO for its financial statements. Or D, its reported cost of goods sold for 2018 would have been 36 million higher if it had used FIFO rather than LIFO for its financial statements. 36 million times 0.60% is the 21.6 million. Managers closely monitor inventory levels to ensure that the inventories needed to sustain operations are available and hold the cost of ordering and carrying inventories to the lowest possible level. Unfortunately, these objectives often conflict with one another. Companies must maintain sufficient quantities of inventory to meet customer demand. However, maintaining inventory is costly. Fortunately, a variety of tools are available, including computerized inventory control systems and the outsourcing of inventory component production to help balance these conflicting objectives. So let's take a look at the next exercise. Apex Industries is a leading manufacturer of plastic packing firms. The company uses the LIFO inventory method for external reporting but maintains its internal records using FIFO. The following disclosure note was included in a recently quarterly report. Inventories are comprised of the following in thousands. So we see raw materials, finished goods, supplies, less the LIFO reserve. The company's income statement reported cost of goods sold of 250000 for the quarter ended January 31st, year two. So assume that Apex adjusts the LIFO reserve at the end of its quarter. Prepare the January 31st year two adjusting entry to record the cost of goods sold adjustment. And then if Apex had used FIFO to value its inventories, what would cost of goods sold have been for the quarter ending January 31st of year two? So as you see here, Year one, we have a LIFO reserve of 38900 and in year two, of 
550. So the difference, cost of goods sold, would be debited, which means an expense is increased, 1650, and we would in turn credit our LIFO reserve for 1650. Cost of goods sold for the quarter ending January 31st, year two. If Apex had used FIFO for, to value its inventory, well, we see the 250 minus the 1650 would give us 248,350. <clears throat> a just-in-time system is another valuable technique many companies have adopted to assist them with inventory management. Just-in-time is a system used by a manufacturer to coordinate production with suppliers so that raw materials or components arrive just as they are needed in the production process. Harley-Davidson is a company known for its custom-ordered motorcycles and the company's just-in-time inventory system is an important part of the company's success. This success enables Harley-Davidson to maintain relatively low inventory balances. But at the same time, the company's efficient production techniques, along with its excellent relationships with suppliers ensuring prompt delivery of components, enables it to quickly meet customer demand. For the year ended December 31, 2015, Harley-Davidson reported motorcycle sales of 5,308.7 5, million million on cost of goods sold of only 356.3 3, million. That's a gross profit of 1,952.4 million, or 36.8% of sales, which far outpaces the industry average. One useful profitability indicator that involves cost of goods sold is gross profit, sometimes called gross margin, which highlights the important relationship between net sales revenue and cost of goods sold. The higher the rate, the ratio, the higher the markup a company is able to achieve on its products. So for example, a product that costs $100 and sells for $150 provides a gross profit of $50, and the gross profit ratio is 33%. If that same product can be sold for $200, the gross profit increases to $100, and the gross profit ratio increases to 50%. So more dollars are available to cover expenses other than cost of goods sold. The inventory turnover ratio is designed to evaluate a company's effectiveness in managing its investment in inventory. The ratio shows the number of times the average inventory balance is sold during a reporting period. The more frequently a business is able to sell or turn over its inventory, the lower its investment in inventory must be for a given level of sales. Monitoring the inventory turnover ratio over time can highlight potential problems. A declining ratio generally is unfavorable and could be caused by the presence of obsolete or slow-moving goods, or possibly poor marketing and sales efforts. So for its 2018 fiscal year, the Hendricks Chemical Company reported sales of $3,500,000, cost of goods sold of $1,400,000, and net income of $140,000. The company's gross profit ratio for the year is 60%, 40%, 4%, or none of these answers is correct. Well, if we take the 3500 subtract the cost of goods sold, we get the difference. That divided by the sales gives us our gross profit ratio of 60 percent. Next, Granger Clothing reported the following in its 2018 financial statements. We have our sales, our cost of goods sold, 
and our gross profit. We have our inventory beginning of 205, a cost available for sale 845, our inventory of 215. What is the 2018 inventory turnover ratio? Again, to figure out the average inventory, we're going to take the beginning plus the ending, divide it by 2. We'll take our cost of goods sold, divide that by our average inventory to show the ratio of 3. Let's now look at exercise 822. The table below contains selected information from recent financial statements of Levitz Corporation and Matilda Companies, two companies in the home improvement retail industry. So we see our net sales, our cost of goods sold, year in inventory, and then the inventory averages of gross profit ratio, inventory turnover ratio, and our average days in inventory. Calculate the gross profit ratio, the inventory turnover ratio, and the average days in inventory for the two companies. So, as you see, gross profit divided by sales gives us the gross profit ratio. Levitt's gross profit of $27,474,000 divide that by our net sales gives us 34.3%. Again, the way we come up with our gross profit is our net sales minus our cost of goods sold. Matilda is 36.6. Now both of those are higher than the industry average. Our inventory turnover ratio is going to be the cost of goods sold divided by the average in year in the average inventory, the twelve thousand three thirty plus or eleven thousand, divide that by two, gives us a turnover ratio of four point five times. And then for Matilda, it gives us 3.79 times. Again, both are higher than the ratio of the industry average. Days in inventory, 81 days and 96 days, which are both better. One problem with unit LIFO is that it can be very costly to implement. It requires records of each unit of inventory. The cost of maintaining these records can be significant, particularly when a company has numerous individual units of inventory and when unit costs change often during a period. A second disadvantage of unit LIFO was identified, the possibility that LIFO layers will be liquidated if the quantity of a particular inventory unit declines below its beginning balances. Even if a company's total inventory quantity is stable or increasing, if the quantity of any particular inventory unit declines, unit LIFO will liquidate all or a portion of a LIFO layer of inventory. When inventory quantity declines in a period of rising costs, non-current lower costs will be included in cost of goods sold and matched with current selling prices, resulting in LIFO liquidation profit. The objectives of using LIFO inventory pools are to simplify recording by grouping inventory units into pools based on physical similarities of the individual units and to reduce the risk of LIFO layer liquidation. Within pools, all purchases during a period are considered to have been made at the same time and at the same cost. Individual unit costs are converted to an average cost for the pool. If the quantity of ending inventory for the pool increases, then ending inventory will consist of the beginning inventory plus a single layer added during the period at the average acquisition cost for that pool. The average cost for this pool is $2.47 per board foot, which is the $98,000 divided by the $40,000 board feet to give us the 
and 47 cents per board foot. Now assume that during the next reporting period, Diamond purchased 50,000 board feet of lumber, shown here on the slide. The average cost of this pool is $2.54 per board foot, which is the 127,000 divided by the 50,000 board feet. Assuming, assuming that Diamond sold 46,000 board feet during the period, the quantity of inventory for the pool increased by 4,000 board feet. 50,000 purchased less the 46,000 sold. The ending inventory would include the beginning inventory and a LIFO layer consisting of the 4,000 board feet increase. We would add this LIFO layer to the average cost of purchases made during the period $2.54. The ending inventory of 108,960 now consists of two layers as shown. Dollar value LIFO is used by many companies that report inventory using LIFO. DVL extends the concept of inventory pools by allowing a company to combine a large variety of goods into one pool. Pools are not based on physical units. Instead, an inventory pool is viewed as comprising layers of dollar value from different pools, periods. Specifically, a pool should consist of those goods that are likely to be subject to the same cost change pressures. Because the physical characteristics of inventory items are not relevant to DVL, an inventory pool is identified in terms of economic similarity rather than physical similarity. The DVL method has important advantages. First, it simplifies the record keeping procedures compared to unit LIFO because no information is needed about unit flows. Second, it minimizes the pro probability of the liquidation of LIFO inventory layers, even more so than the use of pools alone, through the aggregation of many types of inventory into larger pools. Also, the method can be used by firms that do not replace units sold with new units of the same kind. For firms whose products are subject to annual model changes, the items in one year's inventory are not the same as those of the prior year. Under pooled LIFO, the new replacement items must be substantially identical to previous models to be included in the same pool. Under DVL, no distinctions drawn between the old and new merchandise on the basis of their physical characteristics, so a much broader range of goods can be included in the pool. The acquisition of the new items is viewed as replacement of the dollar value of the old items. Because the old layers are maintained, this approach retains the benefits of LIFO by matching the most recent acquisition cost of goods with sales measured at current selling prices. In either the unit LIFO approach or the pooled LIFO approach, we determine whether a new LIFO layer was added by comparing the ending quantity with the beginning quantity. The focus is on units of inventory. Under DVL, we determine whether a new LIFO layer was added by comparing the ending dollar amount with the beginning dollar amount. The focus is on inventory value, not units. However, if the price level has changed, we need a way to determine whether an observed increase is a real increase, an increase in the quantity of inventory, or one caused by an increase in prices. So before we compare the beginning and inventory amounts, we need to deflate inventory amounts by any increase in prices so that both the beginning and inventory amounts, ending amounts, are measured in terms of the same price level. So we accomplish this by using cost indexes. A cost index for a particular layer year is determined as follows. We take the cost index in layer year equals the cost in layer year divided by the cost in base year. The base year is the year in which the DVL method is adopted and the layer year is any subsequent year in which an inventory layer is created. The cost index for the base year is set at 1. Subsequent year's indexes reflects cost changes relative to the base year. For example, if a basket of inventory items cost $120 at the end of the current year and $100 at the end of the base year, the cost index for the current year would be $120 
divided by $100, which equals 120% or $1.20. This index simply tells us that costs in the layer year are 120% of what they were in the base year, which means cost increased by 20%. There are several techniques that can be used to determine an index for a DVL pool. An external index like the Consumer Price Index or the Producer Price Index can be used. Assume that a company adopted the DVL method on January 1st when the CPI was 200. This amount is set equivalent to 1, the base year index. Then the index in the layer year, say the end of the year, would be determined relative to 200. So if the CPI is 210 at the end of the year, the index for DVL purposes would be 1.05. In most cases, these indexes would not properly reflect cost changes for any individual DVL pool. Instead, most companies use an internally generated index. These indexes can be calculated using one of several techniques, such as the double extension method or the linked chain method. A discussion of these methods is really beyond what we're doing here in Intermediate Accounting. In our examples and illustrations, we assume cost indexes are given to us. So DVL estimation begins with the determination of the current year's ending inventory valued in terms of year-end costs. It's not necessary for a company using DVL to track the item-by-item -item cost of purchases during the year. All that's needed is to take the physical quantities of goods on hand at the end of the year and apply year-end costs. Step 1, convert ending inventory valued at year-end costs to base year costs. Step 2, identify the layers of ending inventory and the years they're created. And then step 3, convert each layer's base year cost to layer year cost using the cost index for the year it was acquired. Notice that the cost of inventory increased from $400,000 at the beginning of the year to $462,000 at the end of the year. Does this $62,000 increase in inventory represent an increase in the quantity or an increase in the cost of the inventory? To determine this, the first step is to convert the ending inventory from year-end costs to base year costs. We do this by dividing ending inventory by the year's cost index. So the ending inventory at base year cost is $440,000. Now, whoops, now let's compare the $440,000 ending inventory at base year cost to the beginning inventory, also at base year cost of $440,000. The $40,000 increase in base year dollars signifies a real increase in inventory quantity during the year. Applying the LIFO concept, ending inventory at base year cost consists of the beginning inventory layer of $400,000 plus a $40,000 2018 layer. These are the costs as if each layer was acquired at base year prices. Once the layers are identified, each is restated to prices existing when the layers were acquired. This is done by multiplying each layer by the cost index for the year it was acquired. The $400,000 layer was acquired when prices were 1, and the $40,000 layer was acquired when prices were at 1.05. All layers are added, and ending inventory under DVL would be reported at $442,000. So here we go with a question. On December 31st of 2018, the Burroughs Company adopted the dollar value LIFO inventory method. Inventory at the end of 2018 for its only inventory pool was 600000 At the end of 2019, inventory at year end cost is 8064 and the cost index is 105. Inventory at the end of year 2019 at dollar value LIFO cost is $750,000, dollars or D, 
400. So as you see here, it's D. First of all, the end of 2019 at the end of 2018 year cost is the 768,000. The 8064 divided by our index of 1.05. Then the increase in the end of 2018 inventory at the end of 2018 dollars is going to be 768 minus the 600,000 or 168,000. So we've got layers. The first layer is 600,000 times 1 gives us 600,000. Then the second is the 168,000 times the 1.05 giving us 176.4 combined 776,400. Let's now take a look at another problem. On January 1st of year one, the Baskins company adopted the dollar value LIFO method for its one inventory pool. The pool's value on this date was 700000 The year 1 and year 2 ending value inventory valued at year and cost were 750000 and 820000 respectively. The appropriate cost indexes are 103 for year 1 and 105 for year 2. Our job, calculate the inventory value at the end of year 1 and year 2 using the dollar value LIFO method. So the first thing we're going to do is the end year one, or at the beginning of the year I should say, we have our 700,000 base divided by one gives us 700,000 which is our base. Then from there the 1231 year one gives us our 750, divide that by our index of 1.03 to give us inventory, ending inventory at base year cost. We take the base, subtract the ending uh, 1231 base minus the initial base of 700,000, gives us our 28,155 times our index gives us our 29,000. Then for the next year we will take the amount of 820, divide that by our index of 1.05 to give us our 780. Take that, subtract it from our base. Now year 1 was the 28,155. The difference in year 2, the 52,797 divide that by our index will give us our ending inventory at our DVL cost of 784,437. IAS number 2 does not permit the use of LIFO. Because of this restriction, many U.S. multinational companies use LIFO only for their domestic inventories and FIFO or average cost for their foreign subsidiaries. This difference could prove to be significant, a significant impediment to U.S. convergence to international standards. Unless Congress repeals the LIFO conformatory rule, convergence would cause many corporations to lose a valuable tax shelter, the use of LIFO for tax purposes. If these companies were immediately taxed on the difference between LIFO inventories and inventories valued using another method, it could cost companies billions of dollars. Some industries would be really hard hit. Many oil companies and auto manufacturers use LIFO. The government estimates that the repeal of the LIFO method would increase federal tax revenues by $76 billion over a 10-year period. The companies affected most certainly would lobby heavily to retain the use of LIFO for tax purposes. Well there you have it. We've come to a close for Chapter 8.